invite you to listen in as we have a nice, wonderful, warm discussion with Gazine Thompson. Now, Kazin, there are two iconic uh, female architects in the world. You happen to be one of them. How is it, how is it that you've been able to distinguish yourself the way you have? I mean, there are a lot of bright female architects in the world, people who are competitive athletes, such as you have been. What do you attribute to your success. Can you help us get some insight behind the curtain in this? I know how private you are, and I appreciate you doing this with us. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it is everybody's wish to become something that changes the world. I remember when I was a child, and I'd you know, lie in bed, I wasn't ready to, to sleep yet because uh, I was still anxious to finish the day. And, um, and, and, and there was a day uh, or a succession of, of days where I couldn't sleep, fall asleep, because I had to think about the universe and, and what it was. And I, I mean, I was about nine or ten years old, and, 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 and I can physically actually feel when I go back to that memory how it felt because it made my head hurt because it was so large that thought of the universe and the bigness of it all and life and and it, it was just wow it was just so large and and it made me speechless and uh, and and actually also kind of anxious because I wanted to explore that. I wanted to be part of it. I wanted to be to going to places I wanted. To, I knew I wanted to have an exciting life. I didn't know what that meant at the time. I was nine and ten. I was just, you know, doing everything every other child was doing. But somehow at night this came and, and I wanted to uh, that, that anxiousness to figure it out somehow. And um, and I think we all have that. I'm, I'm sure people want to, to leave a mark and they want to be superheroes and they, they have all these thought, uh, thoughts of how that can happen. And, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I just uh, understood one thing and it has never left me. I felt at that time that life is magic. And I sensed that we are magic. And I think that we are ma magic, the collective we. You are magic. We are all magic. We just need to figure out how to get to the place where the magic allows us to actually go to our pure potential. Because Man, we have potential, lots of potential. So uh, you the said, question is, how do we get there? You said, do you lack passion? No, you, if you, <laughs> do, you have said that doubt is the worst barrier to success. Yes. And, and you said that you also believe in a universal consciousness. Yes. If there is such a thing, as you say, of a universal consciousness, why aren't there more masterpieces in art and music? Why aren't we getting more Nobel Prizes if there is this universal consciousness that you say? You mean, why wouldn't anybody win this, right? Why wouldn't anybody if yes. we're all plugged into this? Yeah. Well, I think <clears throat> that doubt is the gatekeeper. Doubt. Doubt is the gatekeeper of success and getting to the place of confidence. So if you doubt, you will not get to the place of confidence. Mm -hmm. So then you need to find out where is the place of confidence. And that is definitely a place of finding your inner self. 
understanding your potential. And if you have no doubt, there's only space for confidence. There's something you said that it follows along with that, and that is action-based confidence has no doubt, therefore it is right. And then you said something else that confused me. Even if you are wrong, you are right. That's correct. That's what I think. Because you own that wrongness, because even if you make a... So action... Let's, let's go back. Uh, Confidence-based action is the right action. So if you make a decision that you think is wrong, might be right, because there is something else in, in existing, and that is a bigger knowledge that goes from the me knowledge, you have a me knowledge, I have a me knowledge, each of them have a me knowledge, it goes into the we knowledge, what I call we knowledge. And what is a we knowledge? It is the universal wisdom. The universal wisdom is, of course, billions of years old because, I mean, every living thing has been contributing to the universal wisdom. And I kind of um, visualize it as, because everything, I'm an architect, it's all about space creation. So even in my mind, I have to create those spaces. So where's the universal wisdom, the collectiveness of it? And I visualize it as a well, like, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, a um, endlessly uh, a source of, of feeding us. Now that source is the force, and that is the divine spark. You talk about yourself as this source. You also talk about yourself as a bowl. Tell me more about the bowl. Yeah, well, again, you know, in, I think children have a great way of thinking about things because they simplify everything, and so I try to be as curious and stay curious as children are, and so, when I try to figure this one out, I keep it simple. And um, this is what, how I visualize it. If there is a bowl, bowl, let's say you visualize yourself as a bowl. So if you visualize yourself as a orange bowl, you're an orange bowl. Now, if I visualize myself as a flower bowl, I am a flower bowl. If this person here is visualizing themselves as an empty bowl, they are and they're becoming an anything bowl, which means infinite solutions. Anything can be put in that empty bowl. So we need to get to that place of being empty and ready and, and, and let it happen. And of course, there are possibly mistakes. But then go back to the child, a child that, you know, when they start walking, what do they do? They fall down all the time and they accept that. And, and they accept failure as part of success. So if the decision is, if you make even the wrong decision, it is the right decision because you didn't know the bigger picture. And, and it is your decision. It is your right decision, which will unfold sometime uh, at another point. You said there's nothing that cannot be done at some point by someone. Right. I, I, I still, in, t in terms of thinking about how you've distinguished yourself as one of the two leading female architects in the world. You ask yourself, I'm, I'm trying to understand that. I think it is from the very beginning you ask a question of yourself. You said, how can I be significant? Yeah. How can I matter? So it wasn't just about getting an education. It wasn't just about getting a profession. 
there was something compelling you, whether it was this universal consciousness, this bowl that was filled with confidence or something, but you needed to make a significant difference. And you needed to matter. Well, I had a lesson uh, as uh, very early on, I was lucky as a teenager, uh, and it distinguished, it made the difference. Um, I had a lot of energy, <laughs> it hasn't changed. And, <laughs> and so, as a teenager, my parents thought the best thing to keep my energy <laughs> focused was to get me to be an athlete. But there was, I mean, there was a sailing club right next to where we were. And so the natural thing was I started to be sailing. So I spent the weekends at the, at the sailing club and, um, and I liked it a lot because it was physical, it was dealing with the elements and it was, you know, the succession of things. I, I became, t I, te I teamed, then I became a skipper and uh, eventually I started racing and I was a skipper as, uh, while I was racing. So uh, one, one day in spring, I had raced quite a bit already and um, had quite ex some experiences because that's another thing. You have to always show up for work. You know, you cannot think, oh, I'm, I have, it's coming one day. I get the surprise, I wake up and there it is. No, 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 you have to show up for the work. And um, so here was this uh, spring day and it was very, very stormy, a race. Uh, with a field of about uh, plus 100 competitors, very anxious teams on the boats. And it, when it's stormy, it has rough weather, it has, uh, uh, the, and it was cold, and you know, that was kind of a boat that could capsize, and you don't want to, you know, go into that viciously cold water either. So, um, uh, so I did what I did at all times in that race, but something changed because at some point, Jonet was absolutely, uh, it, was, it was amazing because all of a sudden I could connect to the thought process of the skipper on the boat on that side with the skipper that was 100 yards away, the people that chased us in the back, I, could, I was connected to all of their thinking, including, and that was the thing, I was connected to the elements. I could absolutely know that in about 300 yards, the wind would shift. And what it would do to the race tactics, you know, racing boats is like playing chess. You have to make the right moves. I, I was connected. And I mean, it was an amazing situation. It became easy to anticipate what everybody was doing. And I just made my choices out of confidence. And it was, you know, I was connected with my team, with my boat, with the elements. And, and we won the race. And it was so different to all the other, other races that I had won, because every other race that I'd won, we had to fight for. And this one was flawless. It was easy. Have it was you lost fun. That, have you lost that kind of intuition, that kind of understanding, that knowing? Have you lost that since that race? No. You asked me why I can't why I became who I am, because once I had felt it, how it feels to be connected to everything, to the, um, uh, the we mind, the universal wisdom, I know how it feels, how, it, how, how that, uh, uh, what it makes me do inside, and I, I can recreate it. And through that, that's where I create my works. Tell me, tell me, that's fascinating to me. That, 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 that joy, that fascination, that knowing that you have. But tell me how it relates to lying in the dirt of your projects. 
Ah, yeah. <laughs> you must have made a, a little research about my kind of work. I do very unusual ways of working. But because I think if, if we know everything is connected, and I'm asked to do work which is meant for people to be living in, to feel this joy and this magic that uh, we all could feel because we are meant to feel that by the universe. I do think so. Creation wants us to be, uh, you know, glorious, wants us to be genius. So I want to create this kind of places. And so I need to connect to the exact place where I am. So let's say I'm in China and prepare the space uh, where this uh, city is planned, I need to feel what the soil is, what the elements are, where the heat is coming from, where it's coming from. Are there still birds living there? Oh, well, we're talking environmental right now. And in order to do that, I literally sleep on the, in the dirt, in the floor, as long as I need to until I understand the surrounding. You have said the universe that you know is not in a hurry. Yes. Unfortunately, TEDx quiche is. We must now close the curtain. But what an interview of the one architect in this century who will create the largest megacity in the 21st century. I hope you enjoyed being behind the curtain with me as much as I did. If I may say a closing word, please understand we all have that choice to go back to this child wonder. Uh, we all were at that place where we dreamed that we could be an inventor that made the important change, where we we knew that we would be making the next most important innovation, where we knew that, uh, that we would be uh, absolutely important uh, to the future and to the humankind because we, under we dreamed it, and when we dreamed it, we had confidence that we can be it, and we are it. We are the source. We are the force. We are connectedly free. We are connectively the divine spark. I thank you.